World War I was a conflict like no other. It was nothing like a video game where you could detach yourself from the experience. It was always right in your face. It was a war of men against metal. The four-year conflict featured some of the most epic wartime scenes in history, like the Battle of Verdun and the Battle of Somme. They were memorable enough to make any military critic's top 10 list. Ready to take risks, Rambo warriors marched into this war pumped up with patriotism. Each side was determined to kick some, well, you know what, and return home with a chest full of metal. Hollywood also got in on the action, dramatizing the heroism of these human fighting machines on the silver screen. A dashing Gary Cooper played a decorated war hero in the film, Sergeant York. Rest of you, keep on the cover. Come back here. Where are you going? You didn't give me command. But no movie better painted the pure picture of a foot soldier in action in the acclaimed Academy Award winning film, All Quiet on the Western Front. But all was not quiet on the Western Front. In fact, it was one of the noisiest wars the world had yet seen. The battlefields resembled one continuous 4th of July fireworks display. Yet, despite the relentless hammering of shell fire, young men from all over the world took up arms in this global conflict. A conflict that began with a royal assassination. Here's how it went down. In June of 1914, Austria's Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife were shot dead by a Serbian assassin in the streets of Sarajevo, what is now Bosnia-Herzegovina. In retaliation, the Austrian powers that be decided to teach the Serbs a lesson by declaring war on Serbia. This declaration sparked a chain reaction across the world each country taking sides in this combat chess match. Here are the cliff notes of what happened. First, Tsar Nicholas of Russia, an ally of Serbia, began mobilizing his troops. In response, Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm, an ally of Austria-Hungary, declared war on Russia. Germany, certain that France would side with the Russians, then declared war on the French and sent troops through Belgium on their way to France. England and Belgium then declared war on Germany. Three years later, the United States entered the conflict. By the end of 1917, the number of nationalities serving in World War I read like the Directory at the United Nations. In Germany and Russia, enlistment was mandatory for any young man healthy enough to hold a rifle. In Great Britain, Never had a call for volunteers been met with such enthusiasm. Young men served in what were called PALS battalions. Basically, they were groups of neighborhood chums who joined up to go to war together. But this war was no place to strike it rich. The monthly salary for an American private was $33. A German of the same rank was paid 19 Deutschmarks, roughly five US dollars. In terms of dollar and cents, these guys would have been better off keeping their day job at the factory. But money aside, for most men, this war would be the great adventure. It was a way out of their daily ruts at work and at home. And it was the cheapest way to see the world. But this would not be a club med vacation for any of these guys. Just look at the uniforms they had to wear. These macho men are modeling what were the latest runway fashions of the war. As you can see, each country had its own unique design of helmets, jackets, and boots. Also, guten Tag, ich heiße Rolf Galke. Ich bin deutscher Infanteriesoldat im Infanterieregiment Nummer 111 aus Baden. I'm representing today 
a member of the 111th Infantry Regiment, German Infantry Regiment from World War I from Baden. I'm wearing the model 1910 tunic, um, very decorative. This was the model that was introduced at the beginning of the war. You can see very a lot of red piping, very decorative buttons. My regiment went increasingly to leggings, which are wrapped very tightly around your leg and help keep the mud and lice and everything else out of your uniform. The helmet that we started the war with, it's essentially a very decorative weapon. However, as you can imagine, with sunshine, you don't want to be seen, and we reflect the, bra the brass very heavily. So, very early in the war, when we went to the trench warfare, we put these on to make it much more difficult to be seen. The Prussian helmet was the most distinctive piece of a German soldier's kit. Its intimidating steel spike pointed out the obvious. You were young and strong with a whole lot of attitude. This was his pride and joy. The Prussian helmet has the Prussian plate, whereas each state would have its indi uh, individual plate, along with battle honors. Everyone wonders what the spike's all about. It represents the spear points of the army of Frederick the Great. This particular piece of headgear had effect upon other countries because 12 other countries adopted the, the spiked helmet because the Germans used the spiked helmet. Yow! That spike looks more like a lethal weapon than a helmet decoration. The Germans eventually replaced these pointy caps with sturdy steel helmets to shield them during aerial shelling. Soon, the steel helmet became every army's most coveted accessory. The typical and very characteristic British infantry helmet of the First World War. Base in shape, stamped out of manganese steel. It's got a very uh, heavy application of a dull colored paint mixed with some sand in there which which was meant to break up the light on it this particular helmet bears the emblem on the, the tactical emblem on the front of the fourth canadian machine gun battalion so red arrow is the machine gun battalion within the green rectangle of the fourth canadian division for the most part every army's uniform was dark and drab but their nicknames were colorful the british soldiers were called tommies because a guy named Tom was the first name filled in the sample soldier's paybook by the Duke of Wellington. As for the Germans, they were given the derogatory name Hun, after the 4th century Mongolian militant Attila the Hun. No army was spared from name calling. When the Americans entered the war in 1917, they were called Doughboys. Some say their unique donut-shaped buttons on their jackets gave rise to their nickname. No one really knows for sure where the name came from, but it definitely stuck. Salvation Army lasses, as they were called, even began making donuts for the boys overseas. But these dough boys weren't soft and squishy as their nickname might suggest. They were cocky and confident, ready to meet the enemy head on. And this meant taking a crash course in offensive and defensive warfare. What makes us love this country? Land of the brave and free. For most of the Doughboys, it was their first time away from home. They were put through a rigorous obstacle course of infantry training. These guys didn't have the luxury of a personal trainer. Masses of men worked out together. From a Goodyear blip, they looked like a scene from a football halftime show. Columns of men bulking up by doing bends and squats in unison. Most doughboys didn't have the time to perfect these drills since they entered the war late in the game. For them, it became on-the-job training. You're put right on the rifle range as soon as they could, they could 
run you through your physicals and get you your uh, equipment and your uniform and get you to a camp. And this usually took about a week after you uh, signed up. And so you, you went in blindfolded. We're on the rifle range so many hours a day. We're on tactical exercises, the storming and chasing and the closing. And we better get bayonet training, how to protect and how to use the bayonet offensively. Most doughboys got their combat tips from their fellow allies. Here, an energetic French soldier is showing off the finer points of throwing a hand grenade. First, there's the thrusting overarm toss. Next, the soldier must learn to throw the grenade while kneeling. And finally, there's the deadly lob while lying on one's stomach. Boy, this soldier looks like he's been practicing a little too much. Hand grenades were helpful, but infantrymen on both sides of the war went in with a single primary weapon, their rifle. This is the Model 1898 German Mauser, probably one of the finest design weapons in history. Mauser uh, created a weapon that had an extremely strong receiver and bolt. One of the most unique features of this gun is the charging system. A soldier could simply set the charger in, strip in the rounds and close the bolt, making it capable of firing 35 to 45 rounds a minute. The Mauser rifle was an awesome killing machine, something the German soldiers never left home without. And when the German army finally left home for the war, they Great War was not all murder and mayhem. In fact, there were moments when foot soldiers had a downright good time. When given leave from the front lines, men usually retreated to military camps or to nearby towns for rest and relaxation. There were no fancy Walkmans or boom boxes back then. Some men, though, brought along instruments to perform their very own regimental tunes. Soldiers put on their dancing shoes to tap dance alone, or cheek to cheek with each other. Some men even dressed in drag to perform small skits and plays. Women were a scarce commodity, except for nurses. And meeting a nurse meant you've been injured enough to land yourself in the hospital. Kaltka? <laughs> <laughs> the military mailman was always a sight for sore eyes. A letter from the world outside was just what these guys needed, even if the envelope contained a bar of soap from mom instead of a scented letter from their sweetheart. Speaking of soap, forget about taking a luxurious bath. These guys were lucky to find wash tubs the size of their helmets. Military camps were places where soldiers could escape from the pressures of the war not so far away. everything until they could see their reflection. Foot soldiers on both sides of no man's land even tested their skills as artists. Using shrapnel or scraps of material found on the killing fields, they carved and pounded out decorative items that became known as trench art. This is an example of, of uh, what's, what's called trench art. And this is made out of a, out of a French 75 millimeter brass cartridge case 
And the work that's gone into this obviously is indicated by the soldier's ability to flute it here. And then he stippled the case and actually engraved the emblem of his American division. Trench trinkets were great wartime souvenirs. Some of the sculpted knives and bracelets were masterpieces, beautiful enough to be displayed at the Louvre. Making art sure helped to whittle away the time before men returned to the front lines. The soldier was smart. He'd also try to catch some sleep whenever he could, but usually with one eye always open. In many areas on the Western Front, the Allied and German trenches were literally a stone's throw away from each other. At times, the infantrymen on both sides felt they were just as much comrades as they were enemies, stranded in this game of trench warfare. Independent of the big brass, soldiers often made their own rules of live and let live. Early in the war, both sides would often announce spontaneous truces. There were many instances uh, where the, the closeness of the trenches were such that they could actually throw grenades back and forth, or they could talk to e e each other. So there were many instances where they just left each other alone, but they would hold up signs uh, teasing each other. They would sometimes play music back and forth across the lines. You could hear the music. Um, it did have its lighter times, but uh, the next day you might go over the top and you might have to kill the people that you were conversing with the previous day. The most memorable truce occurred on the bitterly cold Christmas of 1914. Across no man's land, British soldiers could hear the German soldiers sing Silent Night. The British applauded and began singing their own Christmas hymns. Both sides were singing Christmas songs, and eventually one brave soul yelled back, you know, he, uh, whether, would you meet me in no man's land? And another brave soul perhaps got it, uh, courage enough to walk out, and they shook hands, and pretty soon men started coming out of the trenches and exchanging, uh, swapping maybe tobacco for, for chocolate. Uh, the officers, although they knew this was wrong, overlooked it uh, in most cases. Soldiers. Both sides laid down their weapons and gathered together in no man's land to share in the holiday spirit. It was a time soldiers on both sides could feel human again, but it was a fleeting moment. British high command was peeved when they heard the news about the Christmas truce. The holiday ceasefire quickly ended. Both sides returned to their fortified ditches. And just to make sure this didn't happen again, the following year, the Allies launched a Christmas Eve bombardment, and for the rest of the war, there were no holiday truces. The live and let live policy returned to live and let die. The infantrymen never had another Yuletide truce, but they did spend three more Christmases battling it out on the Western Front. After the first year on the front, the foot soldiers' New Year's resolution were always the same. Let's just make it through the holiday season alive. World War I was a techno battle of machinery against men. To defend themselves, the supporting cast of the most sophisticated artillery to date backed the foot soldiers on both sides. Modern-day catapults launched 16-inch projectiles that pounded and flailed the landscape. Heavy howitzers called Big Berthas blew towns to smithereens. Both sides fought with the same war toys until 1915, when German high command decided to change the rules. A new weapon exploded onto the battlefields. Its effects would shock the world and change the psychology of warfare forever. On April 22, 1915, near the German front, a French regiment noticed a thick green cloud rising up in the air. Within minutes, Allied soldiers began to fall to the ground. The German army had dropped a deadly dose of chlorine gas. 
the silent game of chemical warfare had begun. The Germans used a variety of gases. Uh, the most horrible was probably mustard gas, which was 35 times more lethal than chlorine gas. Not only did it choke you and kill you, it would also burn your skin if it went through your clothing. They also used uh, forms of uh, toxic smoke. The smoke was an irritant that would make you take your gas mask off to cough, and then they would dump in the lethal gas on top of that. During gas attacks, soldiers on both sides were forced to wear these alien-looking gas masks for weeks on end. Here's how one worked. This filter takes the air in here, and the soldier breathed through this tube. This mask had to be extremely uncomfortable to wear, but it became a soldier's most defensive weapon. Unable to see or hear it coming, poisonous gases became a new weapon in psyching out the enemy. Another way foot soldiers caught their enemy by surprise was with a well-planned trench raid. You see, stalemating was the biggest military obstacle in World War I. Both sides never anticipated that modern weaponry would bring battles to a standstill. Stranded in the trenches, foot soldiers felt like sitting ducks. As a result, trench raiding was one sure tactic to break a deadlock. The German army recruited elite assault units specially trained for this type of siege warfare. They were called stormtroopers. German stormtroopers' morale was extremely high because they felt they could actually do something instead of just sitting waiting to be attacked. These German stormtroopers were programmed to stop at nothing. Always maneuvering at night, their assaults were synchronized and well choreographed. First, they usually sent up a flare. Then they charged over the top and into enemy territory. They used grenades and good old-fashioned hand-to-hand combat to overtake an opposing trench. The trench raids served a dual purpose, to take prisoners for interrogation and to snatch some booty for military intelligence. These guys would grab letters, maps, IDs, anything that could give them info on their enemy's next move. These soldier skills were evident after the Battle of Cambrai in 1917. German stormtrooper battalions counterattacked and drove the British back. Like a scene from a James Bond movie, they captured documents and were able to study the Allies' tactics. Naturally, this forced the Allied troops to strategize their own trench raids. Okay. We'd crawl over there during the night, and we'd lay out in front of the German trench, and we, we had every, oh, every man was given a 45 and a dagger instead of a rifle. And, and myself and my sergeant and uh, two or three other men would have uh, wire cutters to cut the lower wires and then we'd crawl under the barbed wires. And when I'd give them the signal, everybody jumped at once. The Germans also had success counterattacking on the other front, the Eastern Front, the battle line between Eastern Europe and Russia. In July of 1917, the Russian army launched its last offensive of the war. They advanced, pushing the Germans and Austrians 30 miles back. Then they just stopped, refusing to go any further. Russia was in the throes of riot and revolution, and the foot soldiers had lost morale. During this decisive battle, the German counteroffensive shattered the Russian army and made them retreat 75 miles further back from where they had started. This devastating defeat combined with the country's food shortages and the downfall of Tsar Nicholas II's dynasty made the Russian army negotiate a ceasefire with Germany. Russia had now dropped out of the war, but the war's end was still nowhere in sight. 
Never before had men in uniform been exposed to the constant hammering of shell fire. It was enough to give anybody a massive headache. Or worse, a case of shell shock. This great adventure was not what the recruitment brochures said it would be. Many men wanted out. But going AWOL was a no-no. Mutiny could land you in front of a firing squad. Still, after three long years, many foot soldiers on both sides had had enough. Families wanted their boys back home. The infantrymen wanted peace. Everyone wondered what it would take to stop this war. On April 6, 1917, they got their answer. America declared war on Germany. Soon, eager, young American soldiers would be charging onto European soil like the cavalry riding over the American West. After months of training and watching their allies in action, the Americans had finally entered the war and were determined to bring down the German army once and for all. Those who had placed bets in 1914 that the Great War would only last a few months lost their shirts on the deal. The conflict went on for four years and took millions of lives. But on the morning of March 1st, 1918, it looked like the war was finally going to end at last. The Allied forces landed an explosive counteroffensive. It was the first major Allied breakthrough on the Western Front in three years. This time, the Allies were determined to take no prisoners. The British opened the most massive artillery firepower of the war. Over one million shells exploded into the air, including lethal poisonous gas. In October of 1918, the American Doughboys, part of the American Expeditionary Force, were ready to raise some hell. They launched a decisive offensive near the French city of Saint Michel. Our battle plan would be all worked out for us. And this is the way that we would study the terrain, study the German trenches, the German strong points just like you're boxing, you're working out an opponent, you jab him and find out his weak spots, and we found their weak spots. The Americans blasted the Germans with infantry tanks and artillery. The Allies finally brought the Germans to their knees. The soldiers themselves realized that they were up against an undefeatable enemy, especially when the United States entered the war with fresh troops. They saw these fresh young Americans coming over, the ones they captured. They were happy-go-lucky. They were fearless. Uh, they waded into German uh, positions like crazy men. They just couldn't understand these Americans. They were acting like cowboys. They realized they were beat. They were fighting. They were fighting an undefeatable foe, and it was only a matter of time. Time had run out for the German army. Rumors spread of a surrender. We had rumors going about a week ahead of time that the war was going to uh, end. Everybody was being real conservative at that time there, boy. They didn't want to get bumped off at the tail end of the war, but a lot of them got it. On November 11th, the German high command gave in and signed an armistice agreement delivered by U.S. President Woodrow Wilson. Both sides had agreed to lay down their arms Great War was essentially over. When news of the surrender made its way to the Western Front, many German soldiers literally laid down their rifles and walked home. On the other side, the Allied soldiers tossed up their hats in celebration. Victory parties spread across two continents. Every country was glad to have their boys home. In the United States, decoration ceremonies for the heroes were bigger than the Academy Awards. 
Over 120 American men received the coveted Medal of Honor. American Doughboy's ultimate war trophy, however, laid back on the battlefield. At war's end, soldiers scavenged no man's land like starving hyenas for war mementos like German medals, helmets, and automatic pistols. One American soldier paid a French comrade to mail him a 145-pound machine gun. It eventually arrived on his doorstep in the U.S. a few months later. Well, I wonder how many stamps it took to mail that monstrosity. For American doughboys, the so-called great adventure had paid off. They suffered the least amount of casualties, mostly because they entered the war late in the game. They lost roughly 116,000 men. But in Great Britain and France, almost an entire young male population was wiped out in the war. For them, the homecoming was definitely bittersweet. The Great War was supposed to be the war that ended all wars. But the conflict was just the beginning of modern 20th century warfare. In June of 1919, almost five years after the war began, governments on both sides met in Versailles, France, to determine the terms of Germany's surrender. Most Allied countries wanted to punish the Germans. But in the end, the only thing the signed treaty did was stir up hostility and resentment in Germany. In 1939, the Germans would rebound with a vengeance. Many World War I foot soldiers would give a repeat performance in the Second World War. After the dust and shrapnel settled over Europe, the Great War left a mixture of emotions. For most foot soldiers, the conflict was the pinnacle event in their entire life. The spirited brotherhood amongst their comrades in the trenches would never be matched again. Everything would always be measured to it, and nothing would live up to that experience.